So today we are talking about redox reactions. I gave you a handout of information. That information must be committed to memory. So make a note on that paper that you need to learn. Write it and learn big letters. Okay, you need to learn these this information that I gave you. So what happens in a redox? And by the way, redox stands for the full name is oxidation reduction. But that's a long word, right? So we call it redox for short. Redox is a shortening for oxidation reduction. And in an oxidation reduction reaction, electrons are transferred. Okay? Now here in Chem 1, we're going to learn how to identify redox. We're going to learn how to identify what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. But we're not going to learn how to balance redox equations until next semester in Chem 2. Okay, so the redox reactions that we'll be looking at today are not going to be balanced, and that's okay. Next semester in Chem 2, we'll learn how to balance those. Okay, so if you already know how to balance redox equations, great, you're a little bit ahead of the game. Um, and if you don't, that's okay, because you'll learn how to balance those next semester. So during a redox reaction, electrons are transferred. So here are our rules. Now this is, these are our always rules, and they are summarized on your handout. These are the rules that you can always count on. So we have always rules and we have sometimes rules or usually rules. So the first rules we go by are the always rules. And then if we have to, we'll go by our usually rules. So the first rule, and this is on your handout, rule number one, general rule number one, the oxidation number of a pure element is zero. So if it's Cl2, or Na metal, or aluminum metal, or iron metal, or Br2 gas, right? Pure element, oxidation number is zero. And this is rule number one on your handout, general rule number one. For an atom in its elemental form, oxidation number equals zero. So oxidation numbers are just numbers that we assign so that we can compare before to after to figure out what's going on in terms of electrons. So the oxidation number for a pure element is always zero. And this is an always rule. You can always count on this rule. There are no exceptions to it. The oxidation number of a monatomic ion is its charge. That's general rule number two on your handout. For a monatomic ion, the ion charge is its oxidation number. So if we're talking about nitride, right, its oxidation number would be minus three, right? If we're talking about um, sodium ion, its oxidation number would be plus one. Okay, monatomic ion is its charge. Easy enough, that's general rule number two on your handout. And that handout is from a different textbook than your current book. I just think it organizes it a little bit uh, more nicely than the way your book does. But I did give you the page number for your textbook if you wanna see the version in your book. Okay, oxygen in a compound is always minus two, except in a peroxide, right? Peroxides are O2, two minus, right? A peroxide is O2, two minus, right? So oxygen in a peroxide is minus one, otherwise it's always minus two. And there is an exception when it's with uh, fluorine, but you're not gonna be dealing with that in this class, so you don't have to worry about that one. On your handout where it says rules for specific atoms, that's number five. Oxygen is minus one in peroxides, minus two in all other compounds except with fluorine, but you can ignore that except with fluorine. I'm not gonna give you any ones like that in this class. So all you need to worry about, oxygen in a compound. Now if we're talking about O2 gas, that would be zero, right? Because that's a pure element but oxygen in a compound will be minus two, unless it's a peroxide, right? So for instance, in hydrogen peroxide, it will be minus one instead of minus two. Otherwise, it's always minus two. And this is an always rule. We follow our always rules first, and then if we have to follow our sometimes rules slash usually rules, we follow those second. Group one elements. So that would be hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, et cetera. Those guys in compounds are always plus one. So if you're looking at your handout where it says rules for specific atoms, that's rule number one. If 
for group 1A, oxidation number is plus one. So group 1A, in a compound, always plus one. Group 2A, so that's beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, etc. Those in compounds are always plus two. Again, if you're looking at your handout, so you don't have to write this down, number two, under rules for specific atoms. Group 2A, oxidation number plus two. It's always plus two. Fluorine is always minus one. So if you're looking at your handout, rules for specific atoms, rule number four, it's minus one in all compounds. And then there are a couple other ones that I just ran out of room on my slide. Okay, so looking at your handout, hydrogen is plus one with a non-metal and minus one with a metal or boron. That's rule number three. And group 7A is minus one with metals, non-metals, except oxygen, and other halogens. So I ran out of room on my slide for rules for specific atoms for hydrogen and for group seven. And these are always rules, right? The always rules, as the name implies, means that you can count on them always. You don't have to worry about this being, there being an exception to this rule. Okay, these are always rules. And that's good, right? We like the pendability. Now these rules, you gotta memorize them, okay? Make a note to yourself. You gotta learn these rules. The good news is, after you do this a few times, you will commit it to memory. How many of you have molar masses memorized? You probably weren't intending to, right? But after you do it enough times, you start memorizing molar masses. Same's gonna be true with this. If you do it enough times, you're gonna start memorizing them, I promise. And if you don't, you need to make yourself some flashcards to commit them to memory. So these are always rules. Now on the back of your handout, your handout does not have your usually rules. So we're gonna add these usually rules. Group three, so that would be boron, aluminum, gallium, etc. They are usually plus three. Group five, so that would be nitrogen, potassium, arsenic, antimony, etc. They are usually plus five. And then group seven is usually minus one. Like I said, on the front, it, it presents it as minus one with metals and non-metals. Um, but I, I throw it in there as a usually rule because there are some exceptions. The way your, your handout provide, writes it, it basically states an always rule as a usually rule because it lists all these exceptions. And it's just like, oh, it's better to just memorize it as a usually rule. So jot those down on the back of your handout somewhere. Also, these must be committed to memory. So that's the handout that you're looking at and where it can be found in your book currently. And this is the most important rule. This is the most important rule. If your compound is neutral, meaning it has no charge, right? the sum of the contributions of all the oxidation numbers must equal zero. Now, I don't like the way your handout phrases this, because if you look at general rule number three, it says the sum of oxidation number values, and that's not true. The oxidation numbers themselves will not add up to zero. The sum of the contributions will add up to zero. There's a difference between the number itself and its contribution. Okay, I'll show you lots of examples today. And if it's a polyatomic ion, the sum of the contributions need to add up to its overall charge, which again is general rule number three, sentence number two. The sum of the oxidation number values, change that word values to contributions, okay? Because if, let's pretend the oxidation number is minus two, but there are three of them, it would contribute minus six, okay? Those contributions are what need to add up to the overall charge, not the numbers themselves. Because minus two and minus one plus five aren't necessarily gonna add up to zero, right? So make sure it's contributions, not actual values.
So I'm going to show you lots and lots of examples. If you've done redox in the past, then this will be a nice review. I know in biology they talk about redox because I've heard them talking about it. So if you've taken biology recently, um, might be a review. If you did it in high school, again, might be a review there as well. So we're going to go through lots of examples today. Neutral compound contributions all add up to zero. Polyatomic ion contributions all add up to the charge. All right, ready to get started? Again, like I said, you must learn those rules. So let's go through this one together. Assign oxidation numbers to the elements in potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate. So the first thing we want to do is we want to know the formula, right? This is potassium permanganate. So what's its formula? What's the formula for potassium permanganate? LiClO4, right? What is it? K, M, N, what? O4. Okay, so we're gonna make ourselves a little chart. Once you get good at this, you'll be able to do it in your head. So we're gonna have a chart with two rows. The top row is the oxidation number. The bottom row is the contribution. And then each element's gonna get its own box. All right, what do these contributions all need to add up to? Is this compound charged or is it neutral? Is there a plus three or a minus one or anything like that here? It's neutral, all right? So what do these contributions all need to add up to? Zero, okay? So now we're gonna begin with the elements that we have always rules for. So let's just start with potassium. Where's potassium located on the periodic table? Group one, right, do we have any always rules for group one? It's always plus one, right, so it's oxidation number is plus one, and there's one potassium, so what's its contribution? What's one times one? One, right? Manganese, where's it located on the periodic table? Transition metals, do we have any rules for the transition metals? Manganese is element number 25. Do we have any rules for transition metals? No, so we're gonna have to figure it out. We'll come back to it. Oxygen, do we have any rules for oxygen in a compound? Yes, is this a peroxide? No, it's not. So what does that mean oxygen is, in terms of its oxidation number? Minus two, and there are four of them, so what's its contribution? Minus eight. Now remember, the contributions all need to add up to zero. So what number, when I add it to one, and add it to negative eight, will give me zero? Plus seven, right. Now there's one manganese, right? So it's not like I have to divide it by any subscript here. So that means the oxidation number here is plus seven. So these are the actual oxidation numbers. This is just kind of your record keeping to help you stay organized. Notice plus one, plus seven, minus two, that doesn't add up to zero. The oxidation numbers don't add up to zero, it's their contributions that add up to zero. Make sense? Make sense, does everyone see how we did this? Contributions add up to zero, not the actual oxidation numbers themselves. You use the ones you know first, and you follow any always rules first. Then if you have some usually rules, you'll follow those second. And then if you have to calculate anything that's left, you would just use your contribution stick, work backwards to figure out what it must be based on what it has to add up to, okay? So, Let's do another couple examples, and then I'm gonna give you 
some to try. So why don't you try H2SO4, sulfuric acid? All right, let's go over this one. So we're gonna start with the rules that we always can follow, and then if there are any that we don't have rules for, we can figure those out. Do we have rules for hydrogen? Do we have always rule for hydrogen? Yes, we do. Do we have an always or sometimes rule for sulfur? Sulfur's in group six. No, we don't have any rules for group six. We're gonna have to figure sulfur out. Do we have any rules for oxygen? Yes, we do. So let's begin with the ones we know and then work backwards. All right, hydrogen's plus one, and there are two of them, so it contributes plus two. We don't know anything about group six, so we'll have to come back and figure it out. What's the rule for oxygen? Is this a peroxide? No, it's not. So what's oxygen? Minus two. So what's it contribute? Minus eight. So what does that mean sulfur is? Plus six. And there's only one. Right? So it would be plus six as its oxidation number. If for some crazy reason there was a three right here and its contribution was plus six, what would that mean its oxidation number is? Two, right, plus two. So if there were a subscript here, you'd have to divide by that. So these are my actual oxidation numbers. This is just my record keeping to help me stay organized. Okay? Is everybody good on this one? Let's do this one together because we haven't done an ion yet. What is the formula for the chlorate ion? It involves chlorine, I'll give you that. Cl, O3, minus one, right. So now all our contributions need to add up to minus one, right? Because this has a charge. So all these contributions need to add up to minus one, okay? So chlorine, group seven, we say it's usually minus one, not always, it's usually. And your handout even says, except oxygen, right? So that's why I list it as a usually rule. But we've got an always rule for oxygen, right? Because is this a peroxide? No, it's not. So what's oxygen? Minus two, so it contributes what? Minus six, so what does that make chlorine here? Plus five, right? Because if my contributions all need to add up to minus one, plus five and minus six would give me minus one. And there's only one chlorine, so its oxidation number is the same as its contribution. Are we getting the hang of how we do this? Like I said, once you start doing this a few times, these rules that seem really daunting, they just kind of stick. It just takes practice. All right, so I'm gonna pause the video for a few minutes so that you can try these. Sulfur trioxide, copper two nitrate, carbon dioxide, aluminum sulfate, nitrate ion, copper metal, and iron two ion. So use some scrap paper, take a minute. You can talk to somebody or you can work by yourself, and then we'll go over them. I'm gonna pause the video. Okay, let's go over these. So once you get good at this, you can do it in your head. You won't need to make a chart, but I'm showing you the chart just because it's very visual. A nice way to stay organized. So once you're good at it, you can just do it in your head. All right, sulfur trioxide, that would be SO3, right? Is this a charged compound or is it neutral? It's what? It's neutral, right? There's no, there's no charge here. It's not like it's sulfite, right? If this were SO3 two minus, that'd be different. This is just sulfur trioxide. So this adds up to zero. Do we have any rules for sulfur group six? Nope. Do we have a rule for oxygen? Yes. This is not a peroxide, right? So what is oxygen? Minus two, so its contribution is minus six. So what does sulfur's contribution need to be? Plus six, so its oxidation number is plus six. Good. So that's your final answer. Don't put this as your oxidation number, right? That's just for bookkeeping purposes. This is your actual answer. 
All right, let's do copper two nitrates, which would be CuNO, that's a crazy looking O, three, two. Now for your chart, I'll allow you to do something that I wouldn't normally do. If you wanna go ahead and distribute this two, so it makes your chart easier to deal with, that's fine. Okay, if you want to write your chart as CuN2O6 for your chart, that's fine. Okay, now if you turn that in on a test as the formula, I'll put a big sad face next to it, right? Because that's not the correct formula. But just for your chart, so you don't have to deal with that too, and keeping it in mind, you can distribute it for your chart. Okay. So oxidation number, contribution, this is all gonna add up to zero because this is a neutral compound. Do we have any rules for copper transition metals? No, we don't, so we're gonna worry about them in a minute. Do we have any always rules for nitrogen? It's in group five. We have a usually rule, right? But let's start with our always rules. We have an always rule for oxygen, which is minus two, so times six would be Minus 12. Now let's follow our usually rule. Usually rule for nitrogen, it's in group five, right? So it's usually what? Plus five. So that would make its contribution plus 10. So what does that mean copper has to be? Plus two. So those are your final answers. Do we agree? So again, if you want to distribute coefficients for your chart, that's fine by me. That helps you stay organized. All right, let's do carbon dioxide, CO2. Neutral, all right, no charge. So this is all gonna add up to zero. We don't have any rules for carbon, right? Carbon's in group four. But we do have a rule for oxygen. Minus two, contribution of minus four. So what does carbon have to be here? What's carbon here? Plus four, right. Plus four and minus two. You feeling good about these? Feeling good? All right, let's do aluminum sulfate. Aluminum sulfate has the formula Al2, SO4, 3, right? For our chart, we can go ahead and distribute that 3. So it makes our chart more manageable. So let's write it as Al2, S3, O, 12, right? Just for our chart. Don't ever write it like that on a test or you will be uh, unhappy with your grade, right? Because that's not the correct formula in terms of how we would write it. So here's my oxidation number, here's my contribution. This is neutral, it's adding up to zero. We have a usually rule for aluminum, it's in group three. We have no rule for sulfur, we have an always rule for oxygen. All right, so let's start with our always. Minus two times 12 would be what? Minus 24. Now let's use that usually rule. What's aluminum, group three, usually? Plus what? Three. Plus three, so that's contribution of plus six, right? So what does that mean sulfur needs to be in terms of its contribution? Plus what? Plus 18, right? And there are three of them. So what does that mean each individual sulfur is? Plus six, right? So there are my final answers. Notice that the oxidation numbers themselves don't add up to zero. The contributions do. Okay, so this is why the top numbers are our answer. All right, nitrate ion, very easy to do. Should take just a quick second. NO3 minus, we can probably just do it in our head, right? We've done enough of these, I think, by now. Oxygen is what? Minus two, so it contributes minus six. So what does that make nitrogen? Plus five. Right, right, because plus five minus six gives me a minus one charge. And for copper metal, that's a metal, it's a pure element, so what's its oxidation number? Zero, 
And iron two iron uh, ion would be what? Plus two, right? Because if it's a poly a monatomic ion, it's oxidation number is just its charge. Everybody good on these examples? All right, now let's actually talk about how we identify oxidation reduction. Do a couple quick examples of that. So, once you've identified your oxidation numbers, we need to actually look at a redox reaction. So a substance gets oxidized when it loses electrons. So when you lose electrons, in other words, your oxidation number goes up, you are being oxidized. And I'm gonna teach you a couple little ways to remember this, a couple little tricks to remember this. You lose electrons, you're being oxidized. Right, so zinc went from zero to plus two, right? Pure metal, pure element, monatomic ion, monatomic ion, pure element. So we went from zero to plus two. So if it lost electrons, that made its oxidation number go up, right? Because electrons are negative. So that would be oxidation. And then here would be reduction. Went from plus one down to zero. Reduction, bringing you down, right? If I say, you know what guys, instead of having the test on Thursday, we're gonna have it on Wednesday during class. You'd probably be a little bit upset, right? You're being reduced, you're being brought down. So if your oxidation number goes down, you're being reduced, you have gained electrons. Now here are some cute little ways to remember this. Again, I've heard them talking about this in biology, so maybe you've seen one of these before. The method I'll show you first um, is the one I learned when I was like, 14 years old, and then I also learned one when I was in grad school from my friend. So just remember electrons are negative, right? So if you lose them, that gives your number an increase. If you gain them, that makes your number go down. So this is the method I learned when I was in high school. Shout out to my, what, physical science teacher in high school? Leo the lion says grr. So if you don't like lions, I guess you can imagine any sort of animal that would say grr. I just learned Leo the lion, so that's why I went with it. Leo, the lion says, grr. So what does that stand for? Leo, lose electrons equals oxidized. That's what the Leo stands for. Lose electrons, oxidized. That's what the Leo stands for. So like I said, I learned this when I was like 14. So it's been with me for a long time. I think that's evidence that it's a reliable way of remembering it. Lose electrons equals oxidized. What do you think grr stands for? Gain electrons equals reduced, right? Gain electrons equals reduced. So this was the method I learned a long time ago, back when I was in high school. Um, and then in graduate school, husband, before he was my husband, he taught me this method. Maybe that's why I'm here. He was just so good at teaching redox. Oil rig, which is I know what they use in biology too. I've heard him say it. Oil rig. So oil rig stands for... Oil oxidation is loss of electrons, right? What are you losing? You're losing electrons, right? Rig reduction is gain, again, of electrons. So I really don't care which method you, you, you use or if you learned one in your own high school experience, that's great, it works for you. Or if you don't even wanna remember a cute little device, you just wanna say, hey, I lose electrons, I'm being oxidized, I gain electrons, I'm being reduced, that's fine too. So let's talk about one more vocab word before we go into some examples. If you are being reduced, that makes you the oxidizing agent. So agent here means allows to occur. Okay, so if you leave the front door open and your cat escapes, you are the escape agent. You allowed the escape to occur. Right, so if you are the oxidizing agent, that means you're allowing somebody else to be oxidized, which what does that mean is actually happening to you? If I'm allowing someone else to get oxidized, that means I'm really getting reduced, right? Because they go hand in hand. And then if you're getting re oxidized, that means you're allowing something else to get reduced. Right, so reducing agent allows reduction to occur, because it's getting oxidized. They go opposite each other. So if you're getting oxidized, you're the reducing agent because you have to have the re and the dox. 
right, or the reed and the ox. You have to be reduced in order for someone else to get oxidized. You have to be oxidized in order for someone else to get reduced. Okay, so those two are opposite each other. If you get oxidized, that allows someone else to be reduced, you're the reducing agent. If you get reduced, or excuse me, if you get oxidized, you're allowing someone else to get reduced. So, remember, there are, they have to be both. They both have to be present. If there's no change in oxidation numbers, then it's not redox. That's a really important thing to keep in mind. So let me just show you an example of something that would not be redox. Let's pretend I take NaCl solid and I dump it into a beaker and I get this. And I ask you, is this redox? So let's go through and sign oxidation numbers. Sodium will be plus one. Chloride will be minus one. Sodium is a monatomic ion, plus one. Monatomic ion, minus one. Did it change? No, right? So this would be not redox. Or maybe you're doing your oxidation numbers and you're comparing and you notice you've only got oxidation but not reduction. Well, that means you need to go back and double check your oxidation numbers because you can only have them going together. But if no oxidation numbers change, then by definition it's not redox. Okay, so um, your next homework set will ask you those kinds of things, or it'll give you reactions and ask you to identify is it redox or not, and all that good stuff. So let's go through and do some examples involving redox so you can see what it looks like. Okay, so this is an experiment that we've done, right? Electrons being transferred from zinc metal to copper two ion, making copper metal, and then zinc two ion, right? So there's a, something we've done in lab, very similar to something we've done in lab. Let's do this one together. Now, this is a balanced redox equation, but next semester we'll learn how to balance it. Right now, we're not interested in how to balance a redox equation. Okay, we'll learn how to balance redox next semester. So don't worry if you're looking at your redox going, you know what, this isn't balanced. Because I'm gaining three and losing two, that's not balanced, right? Something's wrong. Next semester we'll learn how to balance redox equations. In Chem 1, all we do is learn how to identify the substance oxidized, substance reduced, all that good stuff. So if I give you this equation, which does happen to be balanced, and I ask you what's oxidized and what's reduced, First thing you gotta do is you gotta go through and give everybody an oxidation number using the procedure we just learned. And then if there's anything whose oxidation number doesn't change, we're gonna treat it like a spectator, right? If you start out the same and end the same, there's nothing happening, you're just observing. So we're gonna ignore anything with a number that does not change. So if that's my reaction, let's go through and assign oxidation numbers. Monatomic ion, does the coefficient here have an effect on its um, oxidation number? No, that H just telling me how many. Okay? So don't let that throw you off. Minus 2 times 4 would be minus 8. So that needs to be plus 7. Right? Monatomic ion, monatomic ion, monatomic ion. Plus 1, that's an always rule. Minus 2, that's an always rule. Right? So we're just going through and we're assigning all our oxidation numbers. That's step 1. Are there any substances that can be ignored? Oxidation numbers aren't changing. Yes, there are. Which ones are not changing? There are two that do not change. Which are they? Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen, right. So we're just going to ignore hydrogen. We're going to ignore oxygen because they're not changing. Right? So all we're left with is manganese and iron. So we're comparing manganese before, manganese after, iron before, and iron after. So I just kind of block those out so that I'm not distracted by them. So manganese is going from plus seven to plus two. Iron's going from plus two to plus three. So now I just need to figure out what's the Leo, what's the Ger. All right, so manganese gained electrons, right? Because if you went from plus seven to plus two, you gained something, you got brought down. So is that oxidation or reduction? That's reduction. Right, and iron went from plus two to plus three, went up, so it lost electrons, right? 
So that, oops, so that means what? Manganese got reduced, and iron two got oxidized. So if I asked you what's the oxidizing agent, what would you say the oxidizing agent is? Oxidizing agent would be the substance that gets reduced. So what would the oxidizing agent be? Manganese, right? And what would the reducing agent be? The iron two, right? It got oxidized, therefore it allowed something else to get reduced. Okay, so the next few minutes we're gonna be doing some practice problems. So look at this one. I'll give you a second to try it. Figure out what's oxidized, figure out what's reduced. Figure out what's the oxidizing agent. Figure out what's the reducing agent. Pause the recording. All right, so assigning oxidation numbers is a breeze, right? Because we're all monatomic ions, so there's no chart required. So we're going from plus four to plus three and plus two to plus four, right? So cerium is Reduced, making it the oxidizing agent, and tin is oxidized, making it the reducing agent. Now, if we want to be specific, we would put that charge, right? We'd say cerium-4 and tin-2, right? Because that's technically what it is. It's not cerium the metal and tin the metal. We should technically say it's cerium-4 and tin-2, right? Because we're not talking about the metal. We're talking about the monatomic ion. Do we agree? The Leo and the Gur, or the oil and the rig, whichever you prefer. Okay, try this one. Aluminum metal reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce hydrogen gas and aluminum chloride. Figure out if this is redox, if it is, what's oxidized, what's reduced, what's the oxidizing agent, what's the reducing agent. Let's see what we got this time. So there's our equation. Now if you forgot to balance it, would that have an effect here on the um, oxidation numbers? No. And in terms of balancing it for redox, we don't know how to balance it for redox yet. We just know how to balance it for stoichiometry. But nonetheless, if you forgot the 2623, it would not affect your oxidation numbers. So pure element is zero. And zero, right? Plus one and minus one, plus three and minus one. So aluminum is oxidized, making it the reducing agent, and hydrogen is reduced, making it the oxidizing agent. Chlorine is a spectator. In terms of redux, it's not changing. Do we agree? Do we agree? Questions on this one? All right, try this one, combustion of methane. What's oxidized, what's reduced? What's the oxidizing agent, what's the reducing agent? If it even is redox, maybe it's not redox, you decide. <laughs> Let's take a look at this problem. Methane combustion. So what reactant would this require? O2, right? And what would the products be? CO2 and H2O, right? So hydrogen is not changing, right? Plus one, plus one, so we can ignore it. Carbon's going from minus four to plus four. That's a big jump. And oxygen's going from zero to minus two. Now you can look at it over here. Or over here, notice it's minus two in both of these things. So you can go zero to minus two here or zero to minus two here, right? It's not gonna make a difference which one you pick. So carbon's oxidized, making it the reducing agent. Oxygen is reduced, making it the oxidizing agent. And now that you're thinking about these things, maybe the next time you're out and about, you see you know, labels, it says warning oxidizer, right? What's that mean? What's that mean? 
Well, you know what an oxidizing agent is now. So if you see on a label, strong oxidizer, sometimes when trucks carrying chemicals go by, they have the little symbol. It's usually a hand, you know, with a things happening to it, <laughs> oxidizer. So something to think about out in the real world now. All right, that's where we will stop for today. Hope you have a good afternoon, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.